Once again today we greet you in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We're always glad to have our visitors. Good to see a number of visitors with us today. May the good Lord bless you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up we can be a real inspiration to everyone. And if you in the radio listening audience can get on your phone and call a friend, have them to tune in and get this hour, I do believe we can be an inspiration to them, so you'll be doing them a favor and us as well. If you'd like to have this tape, just write in and close a gift of three dollars to be used to help defray our radio expense. And just say, preacher, send me tape number 291. I'd be glad to do so. I'm going to speak today on seven reasons why God's people should be faithful in the matter of stewardship. And so I hope you'll follow me in the scriptures. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 for a verse and 1 Corinthians chapter 16 for a couple of verses. Now, if you're not getting our daily broadcast, tune in each day at 12 o'clock noon and get the daily broadcast Monday through Saturday. I hope you're getting it. If not, do so. And then if you'd like to have a brochure on a proposed holding in tour, you might write in and request that. If you'd like to have a list of our cassette tape, you might write in and request the list. We have 266 listed. And you can choose the ones you want. Get them by title or by number. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards. P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, let me read verses 1 and 2. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and as stewards of the mysteries of God. Move is required in his stewards that a man be found faithful. It's required in his stewards that a man be found faithful, so saith the scriptures. All right, now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. It's page 1228 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. And follow me in the scriptures. See whether or not I'm preaching what thus saith the Lord God. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints that I've given unto the orders of the church of Galatia, even so do ye, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. Now the first day of the week there we know is to be Sunday. Now I'm going to bring this message today to encourage you to be faithful in your matter of stewardship in response to giving of your means into the work of God. Occasionally a pastor needs to do this and must do it. I make no apology for it. Because God will hold me responsible if I don't let you know what you should do in this respect. If you come to the judgment seat of Christ and God shows you your record. And you see there that you haven't been giving of your means into the work of God upon the earth. I don't want you to blame me. Now if I didn't inform you. If you didn't know any better. Then of course it might be somewhat a different story. I'm going to inform you. You need to know and then it's a matter between you and God. Now, if somebody were to give you something or planning on giving you something as a gift, and that person did not want to give you that gift, and of course the gift is to be given because of love and desire and you want to. Now, that's the reason you should give to God is because you love him and you want to and you appreciate his goodness toward you. And because God encourages us to do so in the Bible. Now, if that person did not want to give you a gift, would you want someone to force you against your will to give you that gift, to get the person to give you that gift? You'd say, preacher, I'd rather not have it. All right. I feel the same way. Now, God doesn't want to force you to give of your tithes and offerings into his work. God wants you to do it because you love him, because you feel like it's right to do so. 
because God asks you to do so willingly from your heart because you love him and not against your will. Not against your will. Remember that the Bible tells us not against your will. If you can't do it because you love the Lord, you want to have a part in God's great work, it is a privilege, an opportunity. All of us can't preach, we can't sing like these singers or play like these musicians or teach like some of these teachers. But most of us have a little income. It ought to be a real joy and privilege to be able to have a part financially in the work of God because you're laying up treasures in heaven. Now I want to mention the seven things, if I have time today without too much comment on each, about this matter of stewardship to encourage you. Now you keep in mind I'm not fussing on you. Not at all. I'm trying to help you as a preacher, as your pastor, to get you to do that which you should, and you'll be glad at the judgment seat of Christ, and so will I. Now notice it shows your love and appreciation of Christ. When you give of your tithes and your offerings into the work of God, that shows your love and appreciation for Christ. Now, if you don't love the Lord and don't appreciate what God's done for you and you don't give, all right, it speaks for itself. Now, if you love him and appreciate him, appreciate his goodness, his mercy, his long-suffering, his kindness, and God's been good to you and kept the fire away from your house and your family, then because of the goodness of God, you should be willing to do it because you love him. Now, you ought to do it because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus so loved, he laid down his life for his friends. The Bible says in John chapter 15, verse 13, Jesus said about the woman that anointed his feet and washed his feet in her tears and dried them with the hair of her head. Jesus said in Luke chapter 7 and verse 47, she loveth much. She gave much because she loveth much. Now, whenever the critic came in, and criticized this woman for placing that ointment on his feet. And Jesus said, she loves me. That's why she did it. She's willing to sacrifice about a year's earning in that ointment to anoint his feet and then to wash his feet with her tears and dry his feet with her hair. Jesus said this woman had been forgiven much. She's forgiven her, her sins. She was a wicked woman. And she loves me very much. And that's why she's given. That's why people give. Now somebody said the old farmer, when I was taking up an offering for missions, the old farmer said, well, I, I think I can give $10 and not feel it. Well, the preacher said, now listen, brother, I want you to feel it. Now if you have to give 10 more to feel it, then give 10 more and feel it. You don't have to give it because you don't think you'd feel it, then you need to feel it. Because God expects you to do so to the glory of God. Number two, the Bible is very clear on the fact that the tithe is the Lord's. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 27 verse 30, and all the tithes of the land, whether the seed of the land, are the fruit of the tree, it is the Lord's. It's holy unto the Lord. And then the Bible says in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, well, wherein have we robbed thee? He said, in tithes and in offerings. So the tithe belongs to God. And then your offerings you give, in addition to your tithes, shows your love and appreciation to God. There was a little girl one time who had ten pennies. And she wanted to give them out, of course. And she placed penny number one down. She said, that's for Jesus. Penny number two went to daddy, then to mother, then to brothers, all through until she came to penny number 10 again. And she placed penny number 10 down and said, this is Jesus' penny. A mother said, honey, you gave Jesus the first one. She said, oh, I know. That was his already. That was the tithe. Said, this one is for me because I love him. I want to give him a little offering. And that's the way it should be. When you give into God's work a tenth of your income, you're only giving to God that, that rightly belongs to him. That's not yours in the first place. Tithing had its principle at the beginning back in the Garden of Eden when God singled all the trees but one and said, all these trees belong to you. Help yourself. Tree number one here, don't touch that tree. That belongs to God. There you have the principle of giving. There even in the Garden of Eden, it runs all the way through the, the Bible. Abraham started according to Genesis chapter 14, verse 20. 
Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 2. Jacob continued it. Genesis chapter 28 and verse 22. Moses incorporated in Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30. Nehemiah restored it in Nehemiah chapter 13 verses 11 and 12. Malachi commanded it in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. Jesus commanded it in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23. God ordained it in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 13 and 14. And Paul explains it in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2 where I read as your text. So that the tithing is a principle that runs all the way through the Bible, which is one dime out of each dollar that you earn. Now God doesn't want sinners out here and cusses and lies and gamblers and people of that type to support his work. God's not that hard up. God could ta turn stones into money if he wanted to. But what God wants to do is get his children that love him to support the work financially, then God will in turn use that to his flow to get the job done. And then God will place that on your record. And when you come to the judgment seat of Christ, God rewards you for that. In addition to that, God will open up the windows of heaven all through your life, on your job, in your business, in your home. And God will be dumping out blessings upon you as you sojourn because you did what God told you to do. Now that's plain and simple. Anybody can understand understand that. Now we need to realize that the way of giving in the Bible, of course, we find three methods. We find that, uh, that uh, in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 10, we have the tenth and you have half in Zechariah chapter uh, Luke and verse 19. He gave half of his goods and then you find the widow gave all that she had. So that's the method of giving. The tenth, half or all. Now God doesn't tell you to give all that you have, but if he did, you better do it. God doesn't say, I want half of what you have. If God said that, you better do it. Now we find these people did, but God did say, I want a dime out of each dollar. That's mine, and I want it into my work. And if you'll obey God and do that, you'll find that you can go further with 90 cents than you could have with a dollar bill. God will see to it. God will breathe on it. God will let you take that 90 cents and accomplish far more in your own needs than you would have if you'd have used the whole dollar kept yours in God's book. Now, the day you realize that, how wonderful that'll be for you. And so the God wants us to give. And then it's the duty and responsibility. God plainly said in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered you. Now the way you know how you should do it, the principle is through the Bible. Give at least a tenth, and then the more above that you give, the blessings of God will come upon you. No doubt about that. He tells us so in the Bible. Give God a little love gift. I don't stop at a tenth. When I give into the work of God, I don't stop at a tenth. I always take that tenth out. That belongs, Lord, that's his anyway. And because Jesus has been so good to me, and the Lord's blessed me over the years, I'll have to give God a little love offering every week. I don't have to do it, but I do it because I love him and I want to do it. God won't make me do it. He doesn't make you do it. But if you do it because you love him, then that's the difference. Now, when you give somebody something and as a gift, you, you do it because you love them. You just love them. You want to do something for them. The same principle is involved in the work of God. Some witty person once said there are three kinds of givers. There's the flint, the sponge, and the honeycomb. To get anything out of the flint, you must hammer it. Then you only get chips and sparks. To get water out of a sponge, you must squeeze it. The more you squeeze, the more you get. But the honeycomb just overflows with its own sweetness. Now, wouldn't you like to be a honeycomb giver? You don't want to be one of these tight white skin flint chase members uh, like the um, a flint giver where you have to be hammered on and hammered on by the preaching the word of God and to get a few sparks out of you. You ought to give because you love God. Now, somebody made this statement, Preacher Edwards, you know I would give, but uh, I, I'm just, I just can't afford it. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. If you won't tell anybody, I don't want this to get out. You keep this to yourself. You can't afford not to. It'll cost you far more not to than it will if you do. Anybody that has an income, I don't care how small or how large, 
If you'll do what God tells you to do in this blessed book, you'll find you're going to be able to do far more what you have left than you would have if you took God's and yours together. Oh, preacher, you can't afford to. I got bills to pay. You can't afford not to. You may have more bills to pay if you don't do it. See, God can help you take care of your bills. He knows how to do that. God's been helping me over the years. I'm a person that believes in paying my just and honest debts. I don't owe any man anything that I wouldn't pay. If I owed a debt, if I could think of a debt owed back yonder 10 years ago, I'd go pay it. I don't, I don't believe in beating people. I don't believe in uh, owing people money and not paying them. I feel the same way toward the Lord. I want to do what is right. I want to give as unto God. Then I love Jesus and I want to give into his work as well because of privilege. And then the Bible says it's laying up treasures in heaven. Now, did you know one of these days you must die? Oh, you say, preacher, I know that. But wait a minute. Not only are you going to die, but one of these days you're going to face your record. Some Englishman nobleman said this. He said uh, just before his death, he made this statement. What I spent, I had. What I kept, I lost. What I gave, I have. And how true that is. When you come to die... Uh, what you spend, uh, of course, um, what I spent, I had, he said, and then what I kept, I lost. And he said, now, uh, what I gave, I have. I'm going in to the judgment seat of Christ. It's on the record. And how true it is. You can make money. You can spend money. You can lose money. But when you come to die, the only thing you're going to have in the way of your finances when you come to die is what God has on that record book when you face that at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, God's not going to force you to put anything on that book. Now, God wants you to do it willingly because you love him. It's the principle involved. There's a young man one time by the name of William. He's 16 years old, came out of a poor family. And his father said, William, son, you'll have to go out and, and try to earn your own living because uh, daddy just can't um, make enough money to keep the whole family. Since you're 16, find your job, son. Boy said, yes, daddy. He was a fine Christian young lad, and he went out searching for a job. He ran into an old sailor he had met years ago, an old sea captain. He said to the sea captain, he said, sir, I'm trying to find a job. We have a poor family and can hardly live and dad is not able to feed us all and I want a job. The old sea captain said, son, do you have any experience in any way in any kind of trade? He said, no, sir. He said, except one. He said, I can make candles and I can make soap. He said, all right, son, I'm going to hire you to make soap. He said, son, I want you to do two things. He said, number one, I want you to make a full cake of soap. Don't go sell a cake of soap or bar of soap if it's not a full cake. You be sure it's a full cake of soap. And not only that, son, I want you to give God a tenth of your income. That's God's tithe. You tithe that income. Now, with that understanding, son, I'm going to give you the job. You know who that man was? He became, he was William Colgate. William Colgate became a billionaire, one of the most wealthiest men in the United States of America. Started out as a 16-year-old boy making soap and candlesticks and giving God his tithe and giving people a full cake of soap whenever they bought a cake of soap. You need to be honest with your fellow man and treat him right. Now, if you go out scheming and cheating and swindling and lying about what you sell or do, you're the loser. Not necessarily the man you cheat, you're the loser. You're the one that's going to lose. If you sell a man a, a cake of soap, be sure it's a full bar. Whatever you sell, be sure it's the right product. Be sure you're honest about what you do. And when you tell a man you'll do something, be sure and do that. Be straight and honest in your business. Now, I couldn't build houses. And I, I don't think I'd be a contractor and be a preacher. I know I couldn't build houses and be a preacher. I'm like the old man that uh, drove a team of mules into town and, and uh, somebody uh, wanted to send him that team of mules and, and he was a preacher and he finally got into town and, and they said, well, what do you think about him, uh, Reverend? Do you think that you might uh, uh, buy that team of mules? He said, I couldn't drive that team of mules and be a preacher. 
They just don't understand my language. I, I just couldn't do that. And so he wouldn't buy the mule. I, I couldn't be a, a good businessman uh, very well. Uh, uh, I especially couldn't be a, a builder in, in building houses like that. Myself. I couldn't be that and be a preacher. I know by experience. I don't, don't you people misunderstand me. There's a lot of you good builders, uh, good dear carpenters, and you build, you build a house and, uh, and uh, you can make money and well and good. But brother, I've run into some things in the matter of building that stand you on your head. I never had as many lies told me in all my life that I've had told me in, in the, trying to get a building put up. Man said, be there in the morning at six. You go back and try to find him next week sometime. Man said, I'll do it for this. Or I'm going to have to do it. It's going to cost you a little more. Man said, uh, you can buy this for that. Well, um, I, the, the price just went up. Are we going to have to charge him? Man said, yeah, we, we can sell you that, and, but we're going to have to audit. Uh, we'll put in order today. Call him a week later. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, we're going to, we got the order in, all right. Turn around in a second. Say, D -d -d how about putting that order in today? Brother, I couldn't, I couldn't be a builder and preach. I might could be a, a builder and a, just an average businessman. Now don't misunderstand me. They're not all shams and crooks and what. Don't misunderstand me. Some good Christian, fine, honest businessman. But I'm talking about myself. Brother, I just couldn't hardly do that and and the priest, I'm like the old man with his mules. Now, a lot of a lot of men might be able to do that. And I guess there are many good preachers that are good builders. But I feel for them. They certainly have a battle and a job on their hands and, and a heartache and, and it, that goes along with it. Now, that's not only in that type of business, but you listen to me. That's in many of the different kind of businesses that's in the world today. And it's sad. There used to be a day whenever a man told you something, his word was his bond. Brother, he could... Uh, he will, you can tell him, he tell you something today and you don't want to believe him or not. Chances are not telling the truth. Chances are not he won't do what he said. That's sad. That breaks my heart. My dad always taught me, he said, son, uh, if you tell somebody something that you're going to do, you do it. If, uh, if you, um, owe somebody something you can't pay it, you go sit down and tell them why you can't and, and they'll bear with you. Son, son, you, you be honest in your dealings. Now I've tried to do that. I've tried to do that. Now, but listen to me, dear people. We need to be honest in our dealings if we expect the blessing of God upon us. This man said to William Colgate, when you sell a man a bar of soap, a cake of soap, whatever, because you be sure it's a full cake. Now, that's the principle there you need to take home with you and keep it. And there was a queen one time that sold all of her diamonds and bought a home for unprivileged children and young people. And she was walking through this hospital. It was a hospital that she purchased in a home. And she saw a young girl there lying on the bed and tears trickling down her cheeks. And, and this beautiful princess said, um, you know, the little girl said to her, said, you know, I've, I've, I got saved since I come here. I, I'm sure appreciate this place. That princess said, I sold my diamonds to build this a hospital, I saw him again running down the cheeks of that little girl that got saved when she came here. Not only did she see him then, but she see him again at the judgment seat of Christ. We need to realize that. Now that in the fifth place, he'll keep the fire away. I believe, I'm a firm believer, if you look after God's business, God will look after your business. If you don't take care of God's business, don't ask God to take care of yours. God lets you run it, get in a mess, get all fouled up, go bankrupt, lose what you got. If you don't, if you're not concerned about God's business, why do you expect God to help you? God's not obligated to help you. But I believe if you will look after God's business and do it right, God will help you look after your business and God will prosper you and it will be done right. It'll keep the devourer away. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. He shall not destroy the fruit of your ground, neither shall your vine cast the fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. God said, I know how to cause your crops to produce. God said, I know how to get your salary increased. God said, I know how to give you strength to work. God said, I know how to make your clothes last a little longer. God said, I know how to keep that fitted and come out of that tooth so you won't have to have it filled. You're not really able to do it. God said, I know these. God said, I know how to keep you well so you won't have to go to the hospital many times when you're not able. God knows how to do these things. 
and if we turn everything over to God and let him help us and look after his business, then God will look after our business. And then number six is a way to get the blessings of God. Now, don't give just because you're expecting great things, but you're going to get them whether you expect them or not. Don't give just to get something back from God. There was a person one time tithing and said, Well, I can't understand why these things happened to me. I, I uh, lost something here and something didn't work out right there. I, I tithe, but, uh, and, and, and then this happened to me. Now, listen to me. Let me have your ears a minute. Because those things happened to you, they didn't happen to you because you didn't tithe. See? You didn't put that down. They didn't happen to you because you didn't tithe. You did tithe. And so you can't blame it on the tithing part. God knows what he's doing. And God will operate your business, help you as you sojourn. And so when you tithe, whatever happens, it goes wrong. It didn't happen because you tithe. That's for sure. It may have happened for some other reason, but if you didn't tithe, it could have happened because you didn't tithe. But if you tithe, it didn't happen because you didn't tithe, because you did tithe. Now you honor God, and God will honor you, and God will bless you. The Bible says in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, Give and it shall be given unto you. Now let that sink in just a moment. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you met shall be given to you again. And so God said, give and it shall be given. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 8, But this I say, he who is so sparingly shall reap sparingly. He that soweth boundless shall reap boundfully. Every man according to his prosperity and purpose in his heart shall let him give, not grudge him necessity. For God left the cheerful giver and is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficient all things may abound into every good work. God says, I know how to take care of you. Now you must realize that God can handle your situation. There's no problem with God. Now I want you to think this over. God made the sun, and it gives. God made the moon, it gives. God made the stars, they give. God made the air, it gives. God made the clouds, they give. God made the earth, it gives. God made the sea, it gives. God made the trees, they give. God made the flowers, they give. God made the fowls, they give. God made the beast, they give. God made the plan, he gives. God made man, he. Now you'll be surprised at what can happen if you'll obey God in the matter of giving. I'm going to pass you just a few surprises, and I want you to listen to them. Number one, whenever you tithe, now just a little thin dime out of a dollar is not much. If you didn't make but a dollar a week, a dime of that's God. You, you young people, we have some young people that give and tithe and so forth. I preach it. They're wise. They are wise. They are wise. Now, if they didn't give, they'd be otherwise. It's like a lot of people that we have that don't give, they're otherwise. But those that give, they're wise. Now you remember that. Now here's some surprises that you have. How easy it is to give the tithe. The devil told me when I first started tithing back in the 40 some odd years ago, you can't tithe, but he's the biggest lie I've ever heard. Been tithing 40 something years. And it's a joy to me. It's a privilege to me to tithe. I, I'd be, I just wouldn't dare not to do it. And so, you see how easy it'll be to tithe if you start and do it? Secondly, another surprise is how far the nine-tenths will go that you have left. God will stretch it out. God will see that you get more accomplished with that nine-tenths you would have with yours and God's put together. Number three, another surprise is how you will grow spiritually. Now listen to me. Let this sink deep down into your ears. I'm telling you the truth. I've been preaching the gospel 45 years. I may not be much of a preacher, but I've been trying to preach for 45 years. I've observed very closely. I've watched my members. I've watched others. And I want you to listen to this. I have never in the past 45 years been able to develop a strong spiritual Christian out of a person that wouldn't tithe. Never. Never. I've never developed. They may go along for a while, but something happens, they don't 
They're not genuine. You cannot develop a Christian that robs God when they know they shouldn't rob God Sunday after Sunday, week after week, and they continue to rob God. You can't make a strong spiritual Christian out of them. Now that some of them don't know it and don't know what they should do, but after the pastor tells them what they should do, then the responsibility rests upon them. And when they rebel against what they know and rebel against knowledge and the word of God and what the pastor tells them, when they rebel against it, they never grow any stronger spiritually until they get straightened out in this matter of giving. And the more you give, Christianity is based entirely upon giving. And the more you give, the more you'll have easy to be for you. And the more you'll grow spiritually and happy you'll be. And you can rejoice and praise God. And not only that, you're investing in precious souls, keeping them out of hell. You're supporting missionaries and, and uh, different camps and works and orphans, homes and so forth. Radio ministry and whatnot. And it's been invested in the work of God. And you're having a part in that. And when you come to die, wouldn't you be glad that you did? Certainly you'd be glad that you did. I don't regret one penny I've ever put in the work of God. I read it all, and you won't either. Now, you'd be surprised how you grow spiritually. Number four, you'd be surprised how you see the blessings of God in many different directions. The blessings of God in many different directions. Oh, somebody said, well, I'll tell you, I was giving, and old Jim Baker, he, well, you don't let that Jim Baker hurt, harm you. If Jim Baker dies and go to hell, you want to go to hell? Do you? Don't let what somebody else does a harm or hinder you. They'll answer God for that. You'll answer God for yourself. You got some people that absolutely are uh, so far away from God and so such a baby's in Christ that they had quit giving for the cause of God because of what Jim and Tammy Baker did, no robbers. Well, that bunch of uh, hypocrites are not going to stop me. God just pulled the cover off of them and exposed them to the world. Well, don't quit whining about that. They'll ask the God for that, and you'll ask the God for yourself. If every Christian ever preached in the world did wrong, you're still going to answer God for yourself. Nobody, God will not excuse you through no matter what anybody does. You ask the God for yourself. How can you see the blessing of God? Number five, this, the amounts you give. Now listen, this is surprise. You'll be surprised at the end of the year how much you've given to God. You, you're going to find out you really given more than you thought you did and how easy it was to do it. You'll be surprised. Then finally, the ease of your conscience. There's not a Christian, listen to me today, born again believer, but what doesn't know that it takes money to operate God's business. But what does it know that God's business is the greatest business in all the world? Now, every Christian should know that. And if you're not having a part in it financially, your conscience ought to eat you up. I mean, if you're saying, if you're not saved, God don't want your money. You take keep it because and if you have a good time with it here and go to hell when you die, what have you gained? But if you're a Christian, you love God. And you, you know these things. Your conscience shouldn't let you rest at night. If you went into a cafe with five or six people and all sat down and ate a meal and, and this, each one had to pay a certain amount, would you sit there and let the rest of them pay your bill? Or you say, preacher, I'm not that cheap. Well, why would you come to the house of God and let everybody else pay the preacher's expense and the, and the light bill and all the connections and support all the mission? And you sit there and enjoy the good auditorium and the cool air and the singing and all the blessings of God. If you got married, you want a church to get married in. If you die, you'd like to have a church and funeral to be preached in. If you get sick, you'd like the preacher to help you. Or why would you want to come and sit back like a wooden Indian and never give a dime? You're like the person in the cafe. You let somebody else pay your bill. You're hoboing your way in. We got a lot of hobos that hobo their way in. Let somebody else pay them. You What is a hobo preacher? A man will catch a freight train and ride it down the track without buying a ticket. And you got a lot of hobo church members. Oh, you say, now, Preacher Edwards, I, I'm going to get mad. I hope you do. Because if you'd get mad, maybe you'd get right and do what you ought to do. And so God will help you if you did. Now I brought this message to encourage you in giving. Don't you give a dime because you think you have to, you don't. God don't have to have your money. And don't you give a dime against your will. God don't want it. But if you love the Lord, you want to do what's right, you want to be honest, you want to do your part, you want to have treasure in heaven, you want to invest in so 
you tithe your income and if you want to get extra blessings to thrill your heart and soul, give a little offering along above your tithe. And when you do that, you're going to see things happening. Now you go ahead and rebel against God one of these days when the collector comes around, God collects his with interest. If you're God's child, God knock on your door if you're God's child and God collect his with interest. And when he collects with interest, you're going to be in bad shape. 